the Irrational Confidence Podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Irrational Confidence Podcast. We're talking college football, and we are recapping a upset at the week number 11. It was a crazy weekend. There are teams going down left and right all over college football. But I'm joined by my co-host, the man who is going to be giving me gray hair as I'm turning the age of 40. My beard's already half white because I can't even stand him off the air right now. My co-host, Fresh Fresh, how you doing, buddy? Hats, I'm doing great. Um, happy birthday. You're turning 40 on uh, the 11th, so tomorrow morning. Um, it was a rough weekend, a lot of upsets. Ole Miss beat the trash out of the dogs. Uh, it is what it is. We move forward. There's a lot of chaos right now in, in college football, but that's exactly what this 12-team playoff has brought. Uh, the debate on who should be in, who's, who's worthy, who's not, what leagues are one bid leagues, and what, league, what leagues are uh, have multiple spots. It's all we still got three weeks left plus conference championship, but every every single Saturday, every single game, uh, they all mean something. All right, fresh. So let's start with week number eleven. What stood out to you that jumped out this weekend? Well, I think uh, first off, you know, um, the lack of energy, the lack of discipline, focus. Uh, for the Georgia football team going into that in, in Ole Miss. Um, I think it's we, we kind of saw glimmers all season long of lack of offensive line, you know, cohesiveness, lack of offensive line play, receivers not catching the football, um, lack of a, a consistent pass rush from the dogs, some secondary issues, and all of it just sort of was one big perfect storm, and Ole Miss just came out and beat the trash out of them. Um, it, was, it was kind of weird, though, like the first couple plays, Sack, sack, interception. Jordan goes down, scores a touchdown. Jackson Dart's kind of dinged up. And I think that the psyche of the team even kind of took a lapse where I figured they had the ball game kind of wrapped up. And uh, they weren't focused. Back and quarterback went down. Let Ole Miss score a touchdown from there. The Ole Miss football team as a whole kind of shook off that, you know, shock and awe and grouped up and were physical at the line of scrimmage on both sides and, uh, and purely dominated. And just adds in where every game matters. You've got to play. You've got to be – almost close to perfect to survive every single week. Um, you know, Georgia has Tennessee this upcoming weekend. That's a, 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 a play-in survival game. If they win, they stay alive. If they lose, their season's basically over. Um, but you kind of – that's what the 12-team playoffs has brought us. On the other side, you know, speaking of just seeing deficiencies across the season and finally coming home to roost, um, Miami's been they've, – they've had lady luck on their side a lot this season. And we've all been kind of waiting for that loss to come. And Georgia Tech – Physical punched him in the mouth, got turnovers, and uh, and and pushed them to a brink. They got lucky at Cal. They got lucky versus Virginia Tech, um, and that luck finally ran out versus Georgia Tech on, on Saturday afternoon. So you kind of saw that happen there, and it really brings into the question the ACC if they're going to be a one or two team lead. Um, you know, Pitt has lost two. Syracuse has kind of been up and down. Boston College up and down. Clemson took a couple losses. Blue the Wolves in there. SMU's been the only two team that's really been consistent, and they're the one loss on the year to BYU. So it's going to raise a lot of questions about the ACC in, in a whole and how the committee sort of sees them. And then speaking of the Big 12 at BYU, they've been, you know, perfect all year long, playing great, and uh, got the benefit of a call on fourth down uh, versus their hated rivals, Utah, which keeps them alive as an undefeated football team, but they didn't look too dominant, especially against a bad, you know, Utah program right now this season. So it's just you've got to be mindful of playing every single football game and playing it tight. Indiana is another great example. Um, that had a, it was an amazing story. Been playing great all year, and uh, Michigan without Will Johnson and a, and a pretty just uh, ineffective offense gave them all they can handle, and um, they escaped. They took care of the Wolverines. You know, it's an amazing win there, but it just shows you've got to be perfect. You've got to be focused every single week, and um, trying to separate who the twelve best teams are in the nation is very, very tough. And I don't want to be the committee, but I have my own opinions. But I don't want to be the the committee and having to make those decisions um, with everybody watching. Yeah, and take a look at even. A thing like Alabama pulling themselves. They took two early season losses and then were able to go in late last night into Death Valley and completely boat race LSU. Unbelievable job out of them. But then you take a look at a team. We talk about the Big 12 and we're, you talk about a team like Iowa State getting clipped yesterday by Kansas and Kansas wins 45 to 36. But that game was not even as close as that score indicates there. Kansas had a big lead on this. They were up at one point, 38 to 20 on them. I think it even got a little more out of hand than that. 
Iowa State made a nice little comeback later on, but also a team like Colorado. Colorado, huge win against Texas Tech. Texas Tech jumped out to an early 13-0 lead, and then Colorado took over that football game. It's a fun one to look at here, Fresh, because everything is going down to the wire and you see teams taking a loss. I'm impressed. I'm impressed by a few of these other teams on how they're kind of handling, how they're responding to a loss. I'm seriously going to be watching Georgia on how they respond this week to the Tennessee thing. I didn't want to, in our preview episode, I didn't want to talk too much about Georgia on it, but there were some major flaws I felt shown on the offensive side of the football in the Florida game. And I was starting to get a little bit nervous about Georgia going into a shoot, what I consider a shootout. Now I thought Lane Kiffin would blunder it and, and kind of screw the pooch on that one. But it really, really was a, a, a rough mark on them. You take a look at what Miami did. They just looked awful and inconsistent against Georgia Tech throughout that game. But again, we also saw, we've seen Georgia Tech pull off some serious upsets this year. So all across the board, there were some huge games that were upsets. There were some huge wins by some teams. And going into week 12, we only have three weeks left. And three weeks from now, we are going to really be looking at those resumes in a blind fashion. And again, I think that's really what the committee is going to wind up doing. They're going to look at things from a blind fashion and say, you know, are we really going to put this team in? And when, at the end of the day, are we going to value the wins on the field? Well, I mean, you kind of look right now, three of, by the AP, because we haven't had the, the updated rankings out, but three of the current AP top five teams in the country do not have a win over a team currently ranked. That's Texas, Penn State, and Indiana. But they're there. They've all, you know, Texas has one loss, Penn State has one loss, and Indiana's undefeated, but they haven't beat anyone of significance um, from a record standpoint at this point. They just have a great record so far on, on, on hand. Um, the current AP top five has um, – only three combined wins over ranked opponents, and you mentioned Alabama. Alabama has mm-hmm. four just by themselves um, of, right. of AP top 25 wins. So Alabama, as bad as that Vanderbilt loss was, and, um, they have some significant wins. Now, the Missouri win, I'm not counting it. I, I shouldn't count that as an AP top 25. I don't think anyone should. They are there, so by the statistic, it is what it is. Um, but for, for the sky is falling kind of, and how bad as they looked versus Vanderbilt, and that loss to Tennessee was actually, you know, I, get, I don't know if it's a solid loss. Both teams kind of look rough in that ballgame. They actually have a lot of wins, and they've quietly regrouped in an ugly way and got themselves in it. Um, you know, it's just also looking at, across the spectrum, ranked games versus ranked games. Where are the eyes of the people? Since October 1st, there's been 18 ranked matchups based on the AP Top 25. SEC has 12 of those. The Big Ten has four. There's been one of the ACC, and then you have Notre Dame versus Navy. Um, the Big 12, that's a glaring issue right there, that there are not many matchups of top 25 matchup, you know, to games in the month of October through early November. Maybe because they're getting knocked off. They've sort of been scheduling. You really can't predict. You can't force ranked teams in the conference to play each other. But we haven't had that gargantuan matchup from the Big 12, which really everyone in the country is focusing their eyes on. You know, um, we had BYU-Utah late, late, late last night. I think kick off at 10, 15, dig it over to like 145, 2 in the morning Eastern time. Not many people were watching that ball game, and if Utah hadn't had so many quarterback issues and, and injuries across the board, that might have been a ranked matchup into it, but it wasn't just due to that, and they still play tough. Colorado's been playing pretty well, but they haven't had that you know ranked, ranked matchup yet. They weren't ranked when they played Kansas State early in the year. So uh, Iowa State, I think they were kind of hoping, but Iowa State's back-to-back losses, that's, that shine has kind of taken off. And I was kind of looking at the stands today earlier. Utah, Oklahoma State, Arizona – and UCF, we had high hopes for coming into the season. That's the bottom four teams in the Big 12 right now, all completely just horrendous fo- football teams. Um, it just shows that the Big 12 has just been every single game, every single team you got to play, they've been beating up on each other. And I think the Big 12 is kind of worried that they're not going to have that stellar two teams playing to get the national attention. Um, they're kind of, I think deep down, they want Colorado, BYU, and BYU to be undefeated to play for the Big 12 title and have that chance to maybe get two teams in. Uh, but their fingers are crossed right and they're holding their breath. Uh, but it's going to be, that's why we play the game. We got three weeks left, a lot of things coming down, plus the you know, championship weekend. 
These rank matchups are going to come into play. Style and eyes right now is starting to really focus in on who is playing at the best level, whose record says them, you know, from a resume standpoint, um, says something and speaks volumes. Strength of schedule, you, you know, strength of record. Um, eye testing, you know, we've talked about it. Outside of the top, like six teams in the, in the, in the rankings, usually your four conference, you know, leaders, everything else from there is eye test and resume. Um, if you win your conference, you don't, it doesn't matter what your resume says, you won your conference. So, You've got to make sure you cover, you know, CYA across the board. You, you know, tidy it up down the stretch and don't leave anything for chance and let the committee decide your fate. Yeah, I think that you're taking a look at a team like Arizona State, maybe hoping that they wind up getting into the rankings this weekend when they're released into the college football playoff committee when they release their top 25. Maybe a team like Arizona State, and you could see Arizona State, K-State, but K-State already with the losses on the year. They're kind of out of it as well. Uh, I don't know if the Big 12 is going to be able to get a big-time ranked matchup up until rivalry week. I'm looking at their schedule real quick right now, and I mean, maybe K-State, Iowa State to end the season, but that's really about it, and neither one of those teams are going to make the playoff. Yeah, that's that's kind of... I think they were kind of hoping for that in purpose, like back in October, let's say October 5th, that weekend. Like, hey, we, we start looking across the room, like, it's the last game of the year. It could have been they play each other, and then the following week they play each other in Dallas for the title. Uh, right. But it shows the 12 team playoff has opened up opportunities for everybody because in the past, like, well, screw it. There's no chance. We're done. So the intent right. of the college football playoff and being spent at 12 teams and us having this widespread conversation here on November 10th. It's already achieved its goal by having people talk about games that matter and keeping the season really, truly valued across the board for everybody to keep their hopes alive, to have a chance um, to really look at different scenarios. Now you're comparing every single conference, obviously, has their own differences, uh, but strength of schedule, ranked matchups, eye tests, just in general, how bad are people beating each other down or are there a lot of close games? You start comparing apples to kiwis to bananas to oranges and trying to find the, I'm going to say the 11 best because you're going to have that group of five team that's going to automatically get in. But how do you sort of put that scenario down? In my opinion, I think the Big 12, it, by having somebody talk talked about this many times earlier in the year, they cannibalized themselves um, because there's a lot of the parity across that league is so spectacular. Mm-hmm. Does that make them one of the two or three of the best full teams in the country? I don't think so. Um, but it shows that they are not, they're not being, one of those teams is not being consistent outside of BYU. Colorado's being a great run right now. The ACC, we, we've had our questions on Miami on the defensive side of the ball. The offense has been putting up points like crazy, but the defense has always left us wanting more, and they finally weren't able to stop Georgia Tech. And I added some right. turnovers. Um, Clemson, if they didn't have that loss to Louisville, then I think the ACC would be in a great spot because then you had SMU, Clemson, and, uh, and Miami looking at a, each having one loss, and then you're really having a high contended moment. I think Clemson's eliminated themselves unless they win the ACC. And SNU has been your darling, and they, you know, I have, the, they have my respect. Their schedule's really solid. Their only loss being to BYU. Um, I think right now, if ACC is a one bid league, in my opinion, as we stand right here, but we still have chaos to go from forward. If chaos ensues right. and Miami wins out and SMU and then both face each other for the ACC title and it is a, a shootout or a close game, that might influence the, the, the committee to put them both in the playoff. Um, cause obviously one's going to be a champion and one gets that at large bid. A couple of weeks ago, actually I had SMU and Miami in my, my top 12 playoff, uh, the past few weeks prior. This Miami loss this week really, it's stunk. Um, because their schedule is lacking substance. And they have not shown to beat a ranked team, obviously, at this point. Um, what were we going to get from the Hurricanes? So I want to see how they, re- they rebound, how they move forward, and who they have to face potentially in the um, ACC title game. The funny part is, if you look at the standings, according to ESPN, Miami's now third of the ACC, and Clemson and SMU are one and two. If the scenario played out like that, would that even, when Miami not even qualify for the ACC title game, um, they might actually want that. And here's why. That's just before I wrap up. Miami doesn't play an ACC championship game with only one loss by, what, three or by five, I think, to Georgia Tech. And Clemson goes and upsets SMU. Clemson's now in the playoff. And then you start looking at a two-loss SMU team who has lost to Clemson and BYU. 
and a one-loss Miami Hurricane team who lost by five to Georgia Tech, and letting the committee debat, debate that, which one's more deserving, and then compare to the rest of the field, who's more deserving out of that. That's the kind of chaos that committee's going to have to deal with. Um, you know, you, we talk about 2007 multiple times. Chaos across the board, scenarios, unexpected outcomes that really drive the, the changing and which play, which way it's all going to play out in the seeding and who actually makes the field. Right. It's interesting, Fresh, here, because, again, we, we're looking at every team and, and resumes and eye tests and all of this mumbo jumbo, because really, it, until we, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and Fresh is getting me worked into shoot prior to this. And, I, and luckily, we record and I calm down pretty quickly. I just got you worked into it. You were dropping, yeah, dropping some words. You good. Right, because you annoyed me. But I take a look and I, I say, all right, we, we criticize certain teams and then we give teams benefit of the doubt. And I raise, I'm going to raise you one. Right now, if the playoffs started today and we just went by like where the committee had team ranked, why, the, why in the world is Texas that high then? Where is I, where is the marquee win for Texas? Because what? I'm, I'm actually glad Vander- you brought that up. I'm actually glad you brought that up. So, and not looking at anything and just going by like what I've seen on the field where they've blown people out, I put them you know my top three. You start looking some deeper you know, deeper things. And this guy, John Sweet Sports on Twitter, the great dude, very informative. He kind of just put it, put it, broke it down from the SEC contender perspective as we stand on November 10th. Strength of schedule, mm. Texas, 55th in the country. Tennessee, 35th, Alabama, 11th, Ole Miss, 23rd, Texas A&M, 21st, Georgia, 1st. So, again, brings your question. Why is Texas so high? Wins versus AP top 25 teams as of today. So, not even at the time of the game of play, like as they are right now, because they might have gotten better down the road. Texas is 0-1 versus AP top 25 teams that they've actually mm-hmm. played. They're currently standing, and that loss was by 15 at home to Georgia. So great point. What has Texas done? And this comes back to the thing we talked about, brand awareness and eyes on product is something that I think that the committee, because they are still people and this is money, it's a business. We've got to remember this is a business, folks. Brand right. awareness is going to screw somebody. Where a, even if Texas loses, Indiana is going to get screwed because IU compared to a Alabama or a Texas, or a Georgia, or a Penn State, or you know, a, a Colorado with Coach Prime and, and Travis Hunter. And Shul. Mm-hmm. The logo, the brand, the fan base, the ratings, that is going to have a factor, folks. And going back to last year's playoff, the reason why Florida State got left out, you can Jordan Travis not being on that field, that was not the same football team. We all know it. And that would have been a terrible product because they've seen in the past in those four team matchups where one team got in that was not truly great and they got the break speed off of them and they were scared that would happen. Brand awareness is going to be a thing. How can we put the eyes on the product, making tight football games, competitive football games? And they're going to be looking to get that because it's a money making business in Texas. The logo itself, the money, that is going to, they're going to look past some of the other stuff if they win out. Um, to, to save their issue, they want Texas to win the SEC just to have that they're in and not have to worry about, well, their strength is scheduled bad. They've only played one ranked team. We'll have two of Texas A&M there later on. How do they decide that factor? Because yeah. there's if no they team lose to A&M, A&M. They lose if they A&M, lose to A&M, A&M. It's two losses. They're only two ranked teams. How? That's it. That's if, especially if it's Georgia, like, let's just say right now, because right now I don't have Georgia in my 12 team playoff as of today when I wrote my article. Wow. Texas, Georgia facing off, both have two losses. Neither a conference champion did not play for conference champion. You have 12, the 12th overall seed. Let's say wow. Georgia State's in, Notre Dame's in. This is for the 12th seed, and those two teams facing off. You have to go by the on field eye test. The head to head right. matchup, Georgia gets in over, and that's assuming Georgia beats Tennessee and beats Georgia Tech and whatever. There's a lot more games to be played. But if you had that matchup, that's how Texas doesn't get in. But yeah. the committee might screw somebody else to put Texas in just to have the logo and the conference. I would be interested for us to put a blind resume test together for, and I'm going to throw out four teams. And I think this might be fun to do. Blind resume test of SMU, Texas, Indiana, and Penn State. 
between those four, because all four of them are kind of in the same boat. If you take a look at Indiana, Indiana is undefeated on the year. They only do have one ranked game on their schedule, and that's Ohio State. If you take a look at, but then you talk about the eye test there. They have both outside of that Michigan game, this piece. And again, oh, Michigan right is is a very they're weirdly dangerous because the defense still has talent and they're trying so hard for the wheels not to come off this season. Because if they, if they don't get to pick up another win, they are staring down the pipe of not being bowl eligible here soon. You take a look at Penn state. Penn state is almost the identical to Texas. I mean, look, they should have lost to USC. That was right. a miraculous comeback. Tyler Warren caught a thousand passes for a thousand yards in that game, basically what it seems like. Um, right. They didn't. Now, if anyone watched the full game versus Wisconsin, they did not play great. They had a right. pick. They were struggling to pick six on a terrible throw. It's kind of what jump started the football team. They didn't run all over the Badgers. They pulled away late because they just basically wore them down. But they were not world beaters there, and they had a ten nothing lead at home against Ohio State, and they blew it. Right. My 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 thought is it really see this is where I get into a hard part for me is I look at all of these teams that have half decent wins and they and again my my darling this year is SMU my my darling team that I have been watching since this probably about week five right now and and I did bring it up early on in the season you know hey you guys got to watch out for SMU this could be a really really good team and they've kind of proven us right that they're a really good football team. I just think that it would just be such a shame to leave out that a team like them, if they go, if they run the table in the ACC, they, their only loss on the year in the regular season is to a BYU. They do have a couple of ranked wins on their schedule already. So their strength of schedule is, isn't, it's not great. It, yeah. The ACC sucks. They actually and, have the best resume in the ACC. Right, they do. And if they go up against Miami and then they lose in a, a close game in the ACC title game, I still think I'd sneak SMU in there. Now, who do I do at the sake of? I'm not totally sure. I don't know who I'm leaving out. I'm shocked you're leaving Georgia out right now. Well, that kind of blows my mind. Here's the thing. If Georgia, Georgia, Tennessee, that's going to decide the thing. Um, Cause I don't, the way it is right now, uh, as of November 10th, you have two losses in the conference. There would have to be chaos, or obviously down the board, to have a three-loss Georgia team get in. Get, their schedule is very, very difficult. It's obviously in a one in the country. It is what it is. Right. They, We all watched the Alabama game, where they were getting boat raced in the first half, had no clue what was going on. And then the second half, they came back, and if it's not for in a generational play by Ryan Williams and lack of – I don't know, lack of gravity, lack of tackling by the two DBs that were trying to get him, and he scored a touchdown. Georgia pulls off the comeback of all ages and wins the game. And at this point, that conversation, what we're having now is moot because I don't care if they lose to Ole Miss or not. That's a one-loss football team year one. But it is what it is. It happened. Um, the Everybody has also seen – they look great for Auburn. Second half, Mississippi State scored a lot of points. Florida gave him all hell. And a lot of, uh, you know, Carson Beck interceptions. And then that team, after that initial, I'm going to say, first eight plays of the game, the first three on defense and then the five on offense score touchdown, they was completely dysfunctional. And everybody was watching, eyes on the product. Everyone saw it with their own eyes. Yes, it was pouring rain, but you know what? As much as it was raining there, Georgia fans laugh at Tennessee fans for 2022 when it was raining in, in Athens in the second half, but Georgia was already up by 18 points. Um, I don't care about the weather. you got to play the football game. Three losses is three losses, and it doesn't matter how great your schedule is. If you're a worthy playoff team and everyone else is ten, you know, ten and two or or eleven and one or undefeated, the wins have got to count for something. Um, and that's why I have Georgia's a little doubt. But if they go out and beat Tennessee, they're right back in the conversation. They're right back where they are. Or we go from you know, move forward on. But if they lose, that's three losses, and it's very tough to come back from that because everyone's already seen and has too many questions about the offensive line, the tackling the secondary, the pass rush being consistent, receivers not catching the football. Um, 
no on-field, no players being leaders. It's, it's, it's not not the same Georgia team we've seen in the past. Um, and that right there is going to, the past cannot keep factoring in to current events and dictating a football team being in or out of a playoff or something like that or getting ranked in the top 25. Right, and the, and I even say something about Tennessee. If Georgia goes out and boat races Tennessee, you put are you and it comes down to let's say we're debating between Tennessee and a school like Indiana. Well, and one loss in one loss Indiana and two loss Tennessee. This is going to be a hard argument to make. Yeah, because again, it's look the, at Tennessee's schedule. It, the one and zero versus they beat Alabama, and honestly, if we if I go back to I test, we watched that football game. That wasn't exactly like the second coming of a football. Both those quarterbacks were right. both team story. It was not a pretty game. Somebody had to win. And you lost to Arkansas, which Arkansas has been a, a pretty solid program, but you were lifeless. In the, you went, look, this thing, two right. straight games. Was it two or three straight games? Tennessee did score a point in the first half. I mean, we're talking about slow starts. So they just won. Their defense is fantastic. They can run the football. Nico in that passing attack is has yet to arrive, but – They've, they've, they've done what they've had to do on the schedule so far, but their, their season is still in the balance, just like George's is. Um, and who knows? They might even lose to Vanderbilt. So you still right. have to play out your schedule. Right. And, and Tennessee, man, I mean, look at, yeah, even yesterday, had to run the ball 57 times. 57 times on the ground in the last, against Mississippi State here. I don't know, man. There's you know so much that's up in the or, air that, ugh. It's funny because as, as, at a time of game, I think Oklahoma and NC State were ranked at the time of the game. But right now, those two have no business being anywhere near a top, no. a top overall in the country. So yeah. it's where we talk about the APs. Sometimes, like, there shouldn't even be an AP top 25 until maybe October 1st. Give the first month to sort of roll it out. But it would give us nothing to argue about for the all of June, July, August, September um, if there wasn't one. So, you know, you, you play the best you can. It's funny we talked about NC State. We, we might have said it was like a big game. We even we were, we were heavy at NC State thinking they were going to be a great football team. They blew, beat the trash out of them, and NC State never got off the mat. Um, and it's actually, I think Tennessee's kind of hoping, like, hey, we wish y'all were better, make our you know make our win look more valid. Um, right. And that, that's kind of raised some questions. Yeah. So, all right, Fresh, here is currently uh, our independent voters who put together our top 12 here. The number one overall seed does not change. And again, folks, this is how the playoff committee would have to schedule the games. So again, Oregon is the number one rated team in our ranking here. Ohio State was number two, but they would drop all the way down to the five seed right now. So Oregon is our number one team, the number two team. And again, this would be, we really are going to need to have this debate is Texas is the number two team, according to our voters here as well. Number three is BYU. Number four, according to our independent voters, is the Miami Hurricanes. Still some love for Miami. I, I and they had them number four. Don't get, the, number four in the country. Uh, they had them. The, what was the? They had to be what number their, four. What was their rank? They are nine. Okay, Nine or so ten. Nine? Okay. They're tied um, with ten. So the Texas thing, because we are going with the conference champion, I think they take care of Arkansas. Um, Texas you know, A&M is going to be the game it comes down to. If they beat A&M, they're going to have they're going to be in Atlanta, and then there's a, if everything played out the way it is, let's just say there's multiple scenarios that can get things done. Whereas it can be Tennessee versus Texas, um, it's probably going to be a Tennessee versus Alabama SEC title game. Um, right. And that's where you throw into if Texas wins, obviously they get that spot. But if Alabama wins, that's Alabama and Texas take someone else's spot. If Texas wins, that's three losses for Alabama. You start thinking, right. oh, the losses matter. Like how who the, 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 all the scenarios are going to be. It's going to be absolute chaos. That's why I love the fact that we can have these debates and heated. But we, reality, we can you know we can think about, we can predict all we want, we can hope for. Reality right. takes into effect in the end. Right. And my, my always, my big thing is always who won, who won, who's got the, you, you can't control You can't change your schedule midway through the year. These schedules are put out so many years in advance. You can't change anything. So I always go by just who won because you only can play the schedule you got. 
All right, Fresh, here is a our number five team. Like I said, that was Ohio State. They would be playing the number 12 seed, Boise State, as well in Columbus. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, the number three team, BYU, this is a weird one. And just as how the rankings fell, Tennessee playing against Alabama in Knoxville. I, I don't think the committee would do that again. I think that in, in the first round, we will not see any I, com- unless it's conference for versus com- conference. Unless you can't avoid it. Like, that's just like, like, let's just say if Ohio State Oregon met to the Big Ten title. Right. And Ohio State beat Oregon. That's Oregon's only loss of the year. That puts them at the five seed. Um, <laughs> Boise State is ranked – Let's say they're ranked 15th in the country, but they're the highest ranked opponent, the highest ranked group of five. They have to be the 12th seed. Then you are going to, in the rare situation, you might just be forced to have that matchup. But I agree with your point. If they, if they can move stuff around on the map, they will adjust to make sure they don't have repeat matchups unless it's completely out of their control. Right. And they end an easy flip flop here, too. I think they could have flip flop Notre Dame as well. But. Texas would be facing the winner of, according to our rankings, is Georgia traveling all the way up to Bloomington, Indiana. <laughs> that, that would be an event. That it would be, be it'd be event. fascinating. That would be a, actually it'd be cold, obviously, be little Indiana. The, it is brutal cold. Bloomington, Indiana. I'm gonna I'm gonna put this question right now. Um, that would be probably the most expensive ticket in Indiana football history. What would, would I be yeah. wrong? Now I'm gonna no, I don't. I'm gonna pose this question to you. Okay. If you could charge, this is where the, you do you want to sell that ticket to a Georgia fan for a crazy amount of money and pocket it and watch it at home? Or go mm-hmm. and be in the in, in, in the stadium. If I'm an Indiana fan, I'm not selling my ticket. But I'm sure if somebody got offered five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred dollars for a ticket, yeah, that's where like in Ohio State, nobody would ever. You, you wouldn't have that happen in Ball in droves. But in other right. programs, where hey, I just want some. That would be an interesting scenario from that aspect as well. Like being at home, having that much you potentially on the secondary market, not just from the game perspective, but how unique that would be. The fans, would they hold their tickets and actually be there in rows to make it a hostile environment? The average temperature in in the week of the 20th of December in Bloomington, Indiana, the average temperature is 34 degrees. And what, sunset at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? Yeah, 4 o'clock. 4 <laughs> o'clock. The high would be uh, 39, 40, and the low possibility in the uh, – Low twenties, so that'd sure be an interesting hot. one. Better yep. Sure and Oregon would be facing the winner of Penn State hosting Notre Dame. That I think that game right there would be a rating bonanza. Yep. Just because I the think fan would bases, too. the logos that would that would draw people in. Casual fans right. to see Notre Dame Penn State in December. Right. I'm Right. And that's the weird one, because I think the easy would be to flip flop either Penn State I, with um, Tennessee or Alabama yeah. or Notre Dame flip flopping those. I would love to see, like I mentioned it before, um, you know, like a Notre Dame, Tennessee, they've actually had a few games back in the 90s, early 2000s, like a home and home series. That'd be cool. And right. Alabama going to uh, Happy Valley would be another fun, like brand image jersey logos where you get. Penn State in their uniforms, Alabama in theirs, clean cut, you know, basic colors, like traditional, that would be really neat. Yeah. Well, I'm leading, I'm going to continue to lead the charge. I'm going to say SMU deserves to be in the playoff. So I'm carrying water for SMU all, all year long, even if they lose the rest of the way. The other teams that were receiving votes, but just on the outside, is Old Miss and SMU both on the outside looking in of the committee right now. It's interesting. No one has Colorado. No one has really any other team left on the outside looking in. Like it's kind of weird. Like Texas A&M is at seven and two. They're just on the outside looking in. 
I mean, Clemson, I think, is a complete fraud of a program, but they are seven and two on the year as well. That's what I'm saying. Like, what if Clemson? Well, I think the South so, Carolina, the, the Palmetto Bowl will solve that equation. Um, all right. If Let me Clemson throw one more thing South at Carolina, you, too, Fresh. South Carolina will beat them and completely just eliminate them from conversation. Let me throw one more thing out at you, Fresh. What do you do with Washington State out there? That's, that's, that schedule is not It's awful. And I guess the schedule's they, awful. They ha- at this rate, the schedule's awful. They are what they are. Um, it's a cool story, but, but they would have to be – there would have to be a lot more chaos. Like we're talking with losses where you just can't. That's why I, like, I talk about Georgia and three losses. At some point, you just can't say like, "Well, they have three losses. They play a tough schedule." Well, if we got Washington State, they might not be great. But if Washington's undefeated, and we had this debate about undefeated three losses, who you play, what your record, what you've done, has to mean something. Um, and who's I, Washington? I Washington State's only lost to. Is it Boise State? It's Boise State. So if Boise State's the group of five representative, they have wins right now over Texas Tech. They have win over Washington. I know not pillars of, of a I mean both teams are middle of the road in their respected conference, but they're still they're still like a they're a pseudo win. mountain they're a pseudo mountain west team right there, aren't they? Because they played they've had that agreement. Right. So like that also is kind but, of a weird unique situation. Like are they treated right. as a? They're, I think the Pac-12 is well, the Pac-2 is more treated as a group of five and a half. Um, right. And if, if we're going to have that discussion, then it, I'm putting Army ahead of Washington, which I already have them ahead. Um, Tulane is probably better than them. Memphis might give them a run for their money. UNLV might be even better than them too. So, you know, it's 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 a weird where record who you played and what you know. Not, like, I'm gonna get. I give my opinion, but I'm very happy I'm not in that room because there's gonna be somebody like in every year in the basketball tournament. We always everyone cries about who didn't make the, you know who's not who is the 64 team left back, and then we have them like, well, they're gonna be a top seed in the NIT. I don't care. Um, right. Your record is what you read. I think 12. We've always talked about maybe too big of a number, but it's caused us to have this conversation here in November, which I think it solved the. It's we're already paid for itself by having this talk right now. All right. And the interesting thing is, like, with Washington State, if they are an 11 and 1 football team, they're not going to play in the conference title game. There's a possibility they could backdoor their way into this thing. Um, bring, funny to bring up the conference championship thing. Uh, in like the Alabama situation, already having two losses. If they can win the SEC right. title game and they get, they get beat by Texas, that's three losses. And what if another team who has. There's a Georgia with the three loss. They get three loss. Then you have that you have that dividing factor. But what there's a scenario where Alabama gets three loss and someone else is that fringe team and you don't have the head to head matchup? Does the championship game punish them? And they're actually more better. right. You get a benefit for not playing that game because right in 2021. That's a good point. Well, well, there's been a couple of years where Alabama at least won, but Alabama didn't play in the SEC championship game until 2017. Mm-hmm. They got to go and they got to make the playoffs. Um, they didn't right. have a chance to expose themselves to a loss or the wear and tear on the team, and they got the benefit of the extra week of rest. Right. It's a, it's an interesting scenario that we're going to have to keep our eyes on there with Washington State. I mean, I'm all up for chaos. I'm all up for shaking up the status quo, man. And I know it, I know money is going to talk, but I'm all for it myself. And it, and it, at least the conversation. Yes, money is the reason why these conference championship games existed in the first place. TV deals, money, et cetera. Um, at what point, and you, I think we're too far down the road to stop it, but at what point do you say, you know what, we don't need the conference championship game weekends um, because if you survive the gauntlet, especially if you go to, if they, all of these go, especially the SEC, go to nine conference games a season instead of eight. Right. What else do you have to prove? I mean, you're only, you're especially if you're trying to protect your best team, like let's just say Miami was undefeated and SMU had a loss and SMU was ranked 18th in the country. I'm putting put them, put them, put them, put them far down for the scenario. And they go in and they beat Miami and they beat them by a, a field goal. Well, you've already taken that net, that undefeated rank away. Now, SMU steals their spot in the playoff. Does Miami get left out because their schedule's terrible? 
Um, you know, then you have you, you expose your potential best team in the league by playing the extra game. Why don't we right. score the trophy to the regular season champion? Use that as an extra break, and then move forward with the playoff. I mean, I'm not opposed to it. I think these conferences are too big that you'll have too many teams with like records. Yeah, It'd be tough, factor. but yeah, you gotta have a deciding fact. They want played on the field, especially if they. It's one thing if you had two teams and they had played head to head earlier in the year. Like again, scenario: Big Ten, you know, Ohio State and Oregon finishes top two teams. Listen, Oregon won the head to head already, given the Big Ten title there in that scenario. I don't know. It's going to be a wild one to watch here, Fresh. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun coming down this track. I don't think – I really don't think, though, next weekend, week 12 here coming up, looking at the weekend, I don't think we're going to get very much clarity, though. Uh, the only clarity I think we're going to get, and then this is my bias, is Georgia standing. Um, are they still alive in, in chance, or is their season – all intents and purposes over. Um, and they are, right. you know, they're done. Like that's, that's the only, I don't think Oregon's down struggle with Washington. I mean, Wisconsin. Um, I don't see any other matchups really, truly shaking out. Like Pitt Clemson a few weeks ago was looking intriguing. That right now is just, you know, does, does Pitt lose in that clear a pass from SNU Miami, um, ACC title game right now? It's the only real door that opens it up. Yeah. What about, I mean, Kansas BYU, because Kansas maybe pulled off that upset last week. Is Kansas going to have another one in them? I I think BYU got their wake up call uh, in the Civil War. You know, survive right. in a tough rivalry game. You know, rivalry games, they're all, you know, we, we talk, they are what they are, especially in that kind of that scenario, that Civil War is, is always a fun uh, situation. That kind of reached out to their mind, I think, to be able to take it out. And then now it's Kansas getting the upset. You're back on, the, you know, they're on your radar, man. I'm like, all right, hey, right. we just beat Iowa State. Let's stay focused. They almost beat Kansas State. We've got to be locked in and prepared. You're not overlooking the um, the Jayhawks like you might have been. If you had gone and boat raced Utah, you might have overlooked them, and then they could have got you. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, it's been nice to put a wrapping in a bow on week number 11. Hey, it's on to the next one. We are three weeks away from Rival Week weekend our biggest weekend of the year it's going to be locked loaded and full of games that we need to check out all that weekend long so make sure you hit that subscribe button make sure you hit the notification bell get notified every single time we drop a new episode make sure you're checking out spinablesports.com because the irrational confidence podcast is part of spinablesports.com like subscribe wherever you get your podcast from leave us that five-star review because you know fresh and i we're those two star five-star prospects and ladies and gentlemen that's all i got it is a been a glorious weekend here i it's a great way had a great time this weekend closing the book on my 30s going into the 40s i i crumb before decades on this earth it's a crazy number to have, Fresh. You're in your big band era. You're in your big band Yeah. Era. I'll take it, um, man. Hey, I'll take it. Really, it was great celebrating your 40th birthday. It was a good dinner. It was um, fun great, time. Great discussion, telling a lot of stories that we probably can't tell in the air. Um, but everybody, hey. No. Hit up hit up Seth. Hit up Haps on, on Twitter. Send him a happy birthday. Um, send him advice for you know for being a, a father or two in his 40s. I'm sure he's going to need all yeah. the help he can get. And, uh, and stay engaged with us. Interact. You know, spread the word, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you for our week 12 preview episode, which will be a lot of fun coming, out, coming your way real shortly. And with that, bye, y'all.